Hi folks, Matt Easton here. Welcome to the next instalment of Five Questions with Matt Easton. Um, thanks again for all of the awesome questions you're posting up under the comments, um, even under the original video I put up in this sequence, but um, I'm still working my way through those to be honest, but keep coming with the questions. Uh, it gives me lots of fuel for, for future videos and thoughts about longer videos and other things I should look into. So, first up, we have a question which caught my eye and has got a number of likes from Tyler Lalonde, um, who is a regular commenter actually. Thank you, Tyler, for all of the thoughts you put on my uh, videos. And Tyler has asked a very intelligent question, saying, Why did Military Sabre leave out skills that were used before, like in Backsword, such as grappling and more use of footwork? Um, well, I'll just address the uh, footwork thing first of all. Actually, sabre footwork is not really very different to um, to backsword footwork. It is a predominantly right foot forward uh, leading foot um, system, uh, which is fairly simple. It doesn't have much traversing, but there are sabre systems which do have traversing in. You can find a little bit in uh, Taylor, and you can find a lot in things like Christman and the Swedish um, sabre systems. So there are certain military sabre systems out there which have traversing. Equally, there is passing footwork in terms of when you're um, closing with someone using a bayonet, for example. Um, but yet, yeah, by and large, it is fairly simple footwork. However, what you see in Sabre footwork is very similar to what a lot of footwork is in earlier systems as well. It might not include as big a scope, but the basics of it are, are not that different to, to stuff that went before. I mean, it's essentially small sword footwork. Um, and it's not that different to certain um, systems of, of rapier footwork and indeed uh, Dusak and things like that. So, um, in terms of the other things that Military Sabre leaves out, well what does it really leave out? Apart from traversing, um, which not all Sabre systems do leave out, some of them have them, have it, um, it basically leaves out what the, the grips and the closes, the grappling. Well, to be frank, a lot of backsword systems don't really have that in either. Um, we don't see that in sidesword as well. I mean, there's hardly any um, grips or grapples in uh, Bolognese sidesword from the 16th century, for example. Uh, there's very little in Dusak. Obviously, there's a lot in things like Langsmesser, um, and indeed, there's a lot in Longsword. I think it comes down to two basic reasons and there are other reasons but there are two I think the most primary reasons why you don't see much um, grabbing or disarming or grappling in um, sabre. Number one it's the nature of the weapon. If you have a light one-handed sword um, such as a side sword or, um, or, a, um, or a sabre which can cut and thrust it actually becomes quite difficult to do any of those grips and grappling uh, quite simply because if you've got a weapon that's either shorter or heavier, or longer and one directional, so for example if we look at a rapier, if a rapier gets knocked aside, it's a very long weapon and it takes a long time for the person to get it back and get the point online, and they can't really cut very effectively with it, not once the weapon's extended. Um, equally if we look at something like the Mesa, it's a relatively short, relatively, um, relatively heavy for its size sword. I know there are light messes out there, but um, certainly the shortness plays a big part here. And with longsword, it's a similar thing. If a longsword gets stopped, extended, it's an easier thing to grab and to try and you know wrap your hand or arm around um, than, than it is with something like a sabre or a side sword. So part of it is down to the weapon. okay. And then the second part of it, certainly in regards to military sabre, is probably to do with the nature of the systems. So what we get with the sabre manuals is on one hand, um, they have a bit less stuff in them, they have less scope in them, um, but on the other hand, they're really, really awesomely good at codifying and teaching the basics. So if you want to learn how to fence with any old, any old military sword, then it, you will learn it a lot quicker looking at a 19th century sabre manual than you will at a 16th century longsword manual. Um, because it's a it's a more codified system. They'd really you know they numbered all the cuts. They had the footwork was um, all very well defined and relatively simple. So on one hand it's simpler and there's less stuff in there. But on the other hand that means you can learn it quicker and arguably become effective quicker. So I think there's many different things at play. But I hope that kind of partly answers the question. 
Right, on to the next question. So, Korkan89 says, How much do we know about combat with battle axes, be it from European sources or other, in other words, for example, uh, Indo-Persian sources? Um, quite simply, not very much. Now, I'm assuming that Korkan89 by battle axes means short, one-handed axes, fighting axes. And we don't know very much about it at all. What we do know quite a lot about is poleaxe fighting, that is, and, and halberds as well in fact, um, that is the long pole arms. So if we're looking at axe-like weapons which are the height of a person or longer, we actually know quite a lot. There are a number of treatises that deal with the use of pole axes um, in armour and out of armour, and and halberds out of armour as well, um, as well as other pole, pole arms, but that's not relevant to battle axes. In terms of short battle axes, as far as I'm aware, they are not dealt with in terms of explanatory techniques in any treatise from anywhere that I know of. Not in European, not in Indo-Persian or Mamluk or Turkish or Indian, or anything that I can think of. None of them really explain um, you know what to do with axes. That being said, a lot of the techniques that you're taught with one-handed swords or falchions or langmesser could be applied quite easily, um, sometimes with the small differences, small adaptations, to short battle axes. Um, yes, of course, we know tomahawks and boarding axes were used in combat, and we know that short axes were used in combat throughout the medieval period uh, it, all over the world. Shut up, cat! Um, and uh, but you know we can only really base what we how we think they should be used on what we see in art and what we know from how to use one-handed swords. Well, this is a bit of fun. Um, this is from Nida Beats, Nida Beats, Nida Beats, um, and this is kind of not really not really HEMA related. Uh, have you seen Star Wars Rebels? And if so, what do you think of the Inquisitor's fencing style? Well, come on, I mean, it is, it's a cartoon, but yeah, I've seen it, I actually watch it, I really enjoy Star Wars Rebels, I think it's really good. Um, for a cartoon, you know, bear in mind it is made for kids, but nevertheless I enjoy it. And um, what do I think of the fighting style in it? Well, come on, it's, it's, it's Star Wars, it's lightsabers, and it's a cartoon. But, that being said, it's enjoyable. I don't have any particular views whatsoever on the Inquisitor's fighting style, uh, other than I think his weapon that spins around with two blades that spins around on a circular handle is uh, it's a bit silly. Um, I suppose it might be good for defending against blaster shots. Uh, I don't know. I don't have any strong views on it at all. Um, and, and also, you know, as I actually commented on the on the thread, which Inquisitor? I don't want to spoiler. I don't want to spoiler any of you. But anyway, that's I can't I can't directly even. Um, even if I stick within the Star Wars universe, I can't directly answer that question without more information. But anyway, thank you for your input. On to the next question. Okay, so this is a really good question actually, um, and probably something that it warrants a bigger video, but um, I, that would require a bit more preparation on my part, so I'll try and give a short answer to it. So, Sharp Knife's Edge asks, Why did bows disappear from the battlefield? I know that firearms had better armour-piercing capabilities, but bows had a higher rate of fire and were arguably more reliable. When armour was reduced after the introduction of firearms, bows didn't really disappear on the battlefield. Um, was that really only due to the training aspect? Okay, so I mean, um, Sharp Knife Sedge has, has touched on, I think, what are the main points about firearms versus bows. Um, number one, training. Okay, so pretty much anyone in probably like 30 minutes can be taught how to operate a musket. I shoot black powder muzzle loading muskets and it's just simple. Now it might not be simple to learn how to be accurate with one but in terms of just loading and firing one which frankly if you're in an army and you're shooting at another army that's all you need to be able to do so long as you're you know not aiming too high or too low. Um, aiming is not massively important at least in that period. Um, and so it's really about reloading quickly enough. Bows, on the other hand, take a lot more practice, and it's not just a question of training in terms of accuracy. So modern uh, modern target archers focus purely on accuracy, really. But obviously, historically, 
a lot of it was about strength training. It was about being able to use a bow that was sufficiently powerful to shoot a sufficiently heavy arrow far enough to be effective in war. Um, so a big part of learning to shoot an English longbow or a Turkish recurve bow or a Mongol uh, recurve bow um, is, is being able to pull a whopping great heavy old, old bow and be relatively accurate with it as well. Um, obviously in battles, again, it's a partly just volley fire. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be really accurate. However, we know that most cultures that practice archery, the, the nations or the cultures that were most famous for archery, for example, the English, the Turks, the Persians, the Mongols, uh, the Japanese, the Koreans, um, these people did practice for uh, accuracy as well. So, um, uh, you know, being accurate is obviously, if you can be accurate, why not be accurate? Um, so, but training to be relatively accurate with a bow um, above anything more than about 30 or 40 yards or meters is, um, I think, takes a lot more training than it does with a, mu with a musket. Lots has been said about the inaccuracy of muskets. In actual fact, I own smoothbore muskets and um, they're not that inaccurate at all. You can hit a man-sized object at um, 60 yards away far more easily than you can do with a bow. Um, <coughs> so that's one part. The other part is so armour penetration. What I would equate it to is not necessarily thinking about armour, although definitely firearms had a bit, big effect on armour, because obviously if anybody can use a musket, then anybody can shoot a, a, a ball through someone's pretty much the best breastplate or, or helmet or leg or arm armour or horse. Um, but it's not only about penetration of armour, it's also about damage that it does to the body. And this is something I have made videos about in the past, and that's about the damage that an arrow does is just nothing um, in terms of killing someone uh, compared to a bullet or a musket ball. Um, and the fact is that a musket ball does a huge amount more damage on average. Um, I know obviously there could be a glancing shot and equally you might have an arrow that goes into your brain and an arrow into your brain would kill you just the same as a bullet into your brain would kill you. But um, on average an arrow into your torso will do far less damage and more recoverable damage more often anyway um, than, um, than a musket ball. A musket ball just blows a blooming great hole and shreds all sorts of things inside you. And importantly, certainly by the 18th century with brown best type muskets, um, the muzzle velocity is enough that not only will the musket ball go into you, shred everything in its path, bone, tissue, everything, um, make a bloody great hole that will kill you pretty quick usually, but it will often pass out of your body and hit someone behind as well. And there are cases of musket balls passing through three people, um, so or, or ending in the third person. So. Uh, Musket balls are hugely, first of all the musket or arquebus is easier to use, it's got a, a, a arguably a long, well I wouldn't say longer range, it's probably got about the same amount of range as a bow actually, um, but it's, it's certainly the trajectory is flatter, so at 100 yards it's easier to pepper a line of soldiers with musket balls than it is with arrows in general. Um, but also, because the trajectory is flatter, that when that musket ball, which is going to do more damage on average than an arrow, goes through a person, it will hit people behind. Very rare that that would ever happen with an arrow. Even if an arrow passes through a person, usually you're not going to be shooting because of the trajectory of the arrow. Think of the trajectory of a musket ball and now the trajectory of an arrow. If that arrow goes through one person, it's going to go through and hit the ground usually. Whereas a musket ball with a flatter trajectory will go through a person and hit the person behind. So, and this is obviously what cannonballs did, they just mowed a line straight through um, blocks of enemy soldiers. So there are all sorts of reasons why, um, why firearms took over from, from bows. And history sh has shown us that the times when people with firearms came up against people with bows, it very rarely went in favour of the people with bows. If we look at um, encounters in India uh, and in Tibet, and North America, where um, European forces with firearms came up against opponents who had bows, it didn't usually go well for the people with bows, um, for all of the reasons I've just mentioned. I hope that sort of answers the question. And there's a lot more factors which I haven't mentioned in there, but I think those are probably the main ones. Right, on to the next question. Okay, so this is hopefully a, a short question to answer. Uh, Mr. Sparkles, <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh, Mr. Sparkles, let's say, 
ha, says, um, any historical accounts of swords being coated in poison? Well, the short answer is, I'm not really sure. I don't really know. Um, I believe in Hamlet, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, um, there's reference to poisoned blades, and I believe that it's mentioned in literature even back into um, the classical era. Um, so it's certainly something that's been mentioned in fiction. Probably, therefore, it was something that someone tried at some point. Um, but um, I don't, I, I, I don't personally know of any historical, historically verifiable um, occurrences of it happening in European warfare in history. Um, but it probably did. That's my answer. Okay, final bonus um, question and bonus answer from Benny Bodin Jagel. Jagel um, says, I still don't understand why you would prefer plate armour instead of chainmail. It gives a little better protection, but if what you say is true, then chainmail should do the job. Well, actually, no. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that plate armour was... Um, <sighs> is vastly more effective, or at least if we're talking about late medieval plate armour made of steel or um, iron, and so iron to begin with and then in, then steel and in some cases hardened carbon steel, um, is just vastly more protective than the male is. Um, if, if someone's wearing a male shirt and you stab them hard with a spear, um, then they're going to get stabbed. Um, the, the male will prevent, um, prevent most cuts However, male is not very good at protect, protecting from impact weapons such as pole axes and maces. Yes, you can put a lot of padding underneath, but padding becomes very hot and, and heavy and limits your movement just like plate uh, armour would do. Um, but uh, against piercing weapons, male armour is really not very good. So if people are shooting lots of, for example, crossbow bolts at you or longbow arrows, then male is okay with padding underneath, has to have padding underneath, but it's not great. Plate armour is vastly, vastly more effective at protecting you from pointy missile weapons, lances, um, things like um, getting hit by a heavy object such as a, such as a pole axe or a mace. Um, so yeah, plate armour is just a lot more effective. And remember, when plate armour started to come in and become really common in the 14th century, um, it was worn over the top of mail, so they weren't actually wearing it initially instead of mail, they were wearing it as well as mail. So they were wearing a full mail hauberk um, or long sleeve shirt um, underneath, which itself was over padding. So padding, mail, plate. Um, and that is enough to protect from, you know, imagine a full powered lance strike on horseback. Um, the amount of energy being transferred into your torso and if, you, if you've only got mail and padding that's going to be broken ribs and maybe it will pierce the mail, maybe it will go straight through you um, that it's going to hurt bad but if you've got a solid steel breastplate no problem, well almost no problem, it's still going to hurt probably but it's not going to badly injure you most of the time um, so yeah, mail is a lot less effective than plate in general um, and you also have to, when you get into like the 16th century for example, you also have to, by which time they could make large steel plates, you also have to think about economy and time as well. And it, quite simply by the 16th century it was fairly quick and easy for um, armoury workshops to churn out pieces of plate armour. And mail is still very labour intensive. Um, so, which is why today, the, really, the only affordable mail armour that you can buy is all made in India, um, probably by... Um, children in factories and so it, you know it's incredibly labor intensive to make male armor and there's nothing that a factory except in modern times there's nothing that a, a medieval or renaissance factory or manufacturing process can really do to make it any quicker whereas um, plate armor a little bit different from that you can create larger plates and and you can churn things out fairly quickly if we look at 17th century helmets for example a lot of them are made in two halves um, and sealed up the, the centre half so you can churn out like pikeman's helmets in the English Civil War or the Thirty Years War you can just churn out thousands of them really quickly uh, you can't do that with mail armour really um, so hope that answers the question okay so this has been today's uh, five questions with Matt Eason I hope it was fun and post your questions below and I'll see you at the next one cheers folks thank you for watching please subscribe follow us on Facebook 
You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.